What's up everyone? So today I wanted to talk about a camera that I've been wanting to get my hands on for a while now. The Canon EOS R. And uh, honestly, this camera is pretty awesome. Um, I've seen a lot of negative and a lot of positive in some reviews and just opinions about the camera. So I went into this um, shooting with this camera trying to have a completely blank slate. Not thinking about any of the negative that other people have thought. Just going into the camera as if I didn't know anything about it and trying to get my own unbiased as possible, most unbiased opinion that I could. And uh, so far, I actually, I like this camera quite a lot, actually. It's pretty good. So uh, let's get into it. So I want to let you know that this review is only going to be just about the camera body itself. I'm going to do a separate video about the kit lens it comes with, the 24-105 f4. Um, there's a lot I can say about this lens, and I figured it'd just be best if I can make a whole separate video just about this one, give my opinion on this. But uh, that being said, just the EOS R body. And let's talk about the body itself. Just the feeling and how it sits. And honestly, this thing, really comfortable. It, um, it just kind of feels right. I love my Sony, don't get me wrong, but one issue that I have with my Sony that most people do is pinky kind of falls off a little bit. Um, if the body was just a little bit longer, just half an inch longer, it'd be it'd be much more comfortable, you could fit a little better. Also, the handle kind of comes out a little bit more on this one, just more comfortable. Just the overall grip on this thing is just a lot easier and a lot more user-friendly. That being said, though, the record button is in kind of a strange place. Then again, some Sony's have it in a weird area too. You have them over here. Um, I'm not sure where uh, Nikon's have theirs, but so far finding a record button on a camera is still kind of just a strange place doesn't seem like that big of a deal but when you're trying to record and got to go up here it's kind of strange but not that big of a deal overall though great camera i absolutely love it the lcd screen is amazing so if you want to just traditional you have your lcd screen right in the back here one thing that's really cool about the screen is you want to be extra safe extra protective with it when you're not using it flipped over your screen is protected. You don't have to worry about something accidentally scratching it or damaging it or something. It's just a really nice useful feature. And then also, if you're going to be doing any sort of vlogging or tutorials or anything you want to see what you're doing, flip it out front. Everybody knows Sony doesn't do this. Why they don't do it I don't know. The fact that Canon does it is awesome and the screen is just super useful, super friendly. And on top of that, the quality of the screen is really, really good. I I did have to turn the brightness up a little bit when I was outside in order to really see it, but turned up the brightness one or two levels and I can see it perfect. Even with glasses on, I can still see everything on the screen with great definition. Another thing is, even with turning the brightness up on the screen, having the Wi-Fi connected to my phone, the battery lasted super long. I didn't worry about once I turned the brightness up on the screen, I wonder if I'm going to be draining my battery quicker or anything. I was able to still shoot a whole day with this, with the brightness turned up, with using a microphone, with taking a bunch of pictures, and I think probably about five, six hours worth of doing that, and I was still at 40% on my battery. Battery has a strong charge. So overall, this camera is looking pretty good so far. So honestly, one of the greatest features about this camera, hands down, is the autofocus. Without a doubt, this is one of the greatest autofocuses in the camera world right now. Not just in mirrorless cameras, DSLRs, mirrorless, anything. This autofocus is amazing. Dual pixel autofocus that Canon does right now, in, I have a demonstration that I'll put up right here. It's lightning quick. It's super accurate. Uh, one thing that's really cool about the LCD screen is if you have autofocus on, dual pixel autofocus, you have kind of like a little joystick, which a lot of people are upset that there's not an actual joystick on here, but whatever. So put your screen right here, or put your thumb right here, and on the viewfinder, it shows a little box that pops up, and you kind of pick where you want your autofocus to go. And like I said, I have a demonstration I'll show you. On my face right now, on the wall behind me, back to my face, wall, face you can pick something here and then pick something behind it right next right next to it but behind it way far off and it's gonna catch it insanely quick and it's just really really convenient to be able to select so, so easily what you want your autofocus to be on and it's really really accurate too um, try focusing by hand especially that quick you're not gonna get it on 
Now, if you are going to be focusing by hand, one thing that they have on this camera that I'm used to coming from the Sony world that I know a lot of other cameras don't have is peaking, which to me, if I, I do a lot of focusing by hand, I can't imagine doing any sort of focusing without peaking. It just makes it so much easier, so much more user-friendly showing you exactly what is in focus. With that being said though, Sony's have three modes that you can choose on peaking. You can choose low, medium, or high. High seems too high for it, low is too low, and medium is just perfect. On this one, you have low and high. And it's kind of the same thing. Low is a little too low, and high is a little too high. It would be nice if there was a third setting on here, a uh, third peaking level, just nice middle, nice medium. When you have it on high, it kind of looks like everything's in focus. You take the picture, you take the photo, you take a video, whatever, and then you look back and you realize, no, it was only one thing in focus, but it's hard to show in the peaking what is in focus. Low, same thing. It, you only get a couple little dots that come up and you can't really quite tell exactly where your focus is. Um, it's nice that they got peaking, but it would be nice if they had a medium setting for the peaking. So, like I said, I tried going into this review forgetting about what other what, what other people's opinions were on some of the negative sides of this camera. And one of the things that I tried to forget about and I tried to figure, you know what, I'm going to use it to see what I think, is the touch bar, the track bar. And I thought, you know, that might be a cool feature. It's kind of, it's basically like another wheel. I tried it. I, I don't like it. I understand why everybody else in every review, every article, everything I've seen doesn't like it either. Um, I put my ISO on here originally and if you, there's two settings you can do, where one where you hold it and then you got to do it, which kind of defeats the purpose of having a quick uh, user-friendly setting, or you can just tap it. But if you just tap it, you can do that very easily by accident, bump your ISO up, bump your ISO down, or whatever other setting you have on there. I don't understand what the idea was doing this was instead of just putting another wheel. You put another wheel here, you can still customize it, still decide if you want ISO or shutter speed or white balance or whatever you want there. This touch bar, it's a cool idea to try and do something new, but I just didn't find it very useful. I used it the first day I had this camera. I tried to use it, I forced myself to use it. I don't like it, I stopped using it altogether, set my ISO somewhere different, and yeah, the touch bar, it does nothing for the camera. So the viewfinder on this camera is amazing. Um, not only is it ridiculously bright, really clear, it's huge. You put your eye up to it. You know, most cameras you gotta kinda like, kinda you gotta shove it into your eye that way you can really see it. This one, you can hold it quite a bit away and still see everything totally fine. You bring it all the way up, you can see everything really clear, really bright, and it's just, it's refreshing to have a viewfinder that's so large. Even though when you're looking at it, it doesn't really seem to take up a lot of space. You actually put your eye up to it and it's like having a nice large screen. You're not having to squint to be able to see everything. Great viewfinder on this camera. So something else that I saw a lot of people talking about and I tried to ignore and tried to go into this just with my own opinion is the frame rates. Um, I didn't really have an issue only having 60 frames per second frame rate. I know a lot of people wish it had 120. Um, the 1DX Mark II has 120, the Sony A7 II, A7S, I mean Sony A7 III, A7S II, so on. Those have 120. It'd be nice to have 120, but as far as slow motion goes, I'm okay with 60 personally. Um, 120 would be great, not a big deal. My issue though wasn't necessarily with the frame rate so much. I, I had all the frame rates that I wanted. My issue was with the cropping. You go into 4K, you get a crop. You go into uh, the image stabilization, you get a crop. Basically, any mode other than just 720 or 1080, 1080 at 24 frames per second specifically, not 60. You get a crop on basically anything you're gonna do other than just standard 1080 or standard 720. No one uses 720, so really 1080 is gonna be your only format that doesn't crop. So my frame rates, I had no issue with. It was the cropping on everything. Um, again, Sony's, I don't have cropping unless you buy one of the A6000, 6500, whatever. I got no cropping. You do 120, you get a little bit of cropping, but that's about it. You're not doing, you're not filming everything in 120. So. It is a full frame camera, but it's only full frame in select scenarios. You take pictures, you're good. You do 1080, you're good. Anything else, you lose the full frame aspect of that. And for this price, it would be nice if it was completely a full frame camera, but that's just my opinion. Another thing on the 4K on this camera, um, you do have 4K, it's amazing 4K, except you only have 
24 frames per second 4K. You don't have 60. So if you do want to do slow motion, it is going to be in 1080. It's going to be cropped in 1080. Um, one issue, not major, but it is still something that I noticed. It would be nice to have 60 frames per second in 4K. So like I said, I wish the touch bar was a wheel instead, but if for whatever reason they just absolutely needed to put a touch bar on there, I wish that this was a wheel. I wish that your your four-way bar would, be, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but I wish that was a wheel. I'm, I put my ISO on there on my Sony. It's really convenient. You have your ISO right there. You can do that. I don't know how hard it would have been for them to make that a wheel. Um, it's not a deal breaker. It would. You can set ISO almost anywhere on this camera or you set anything else almost anywhere on this camera. It just would have been nice if that was a wheel as well. I don't know why it's not. Would have been a nice feature. So coming from a Sony that has a notoriously difficult menu to navigate, something that has a lot of options, a lot of customizability, which can be a good thing, but just learning it, trying to figure it out, it can be kind of difficult. The menu on this thing is amazing. Super easy, super user-friendly. Um, you know I want to do this. Without knowing where it is, you can find it very easy, find it very quick. Very user-friendly menu. Somebody that's never used a Canon or probably a camera even of this kind of quality before at all could probably pick this up and figure out this is what I want to do to change this. Very quick and easy user-friendly menu. Um, I hope Canon doesn't change that. That's one thing that they should just stay with the menu format they have on here. It's great. No reason to change it. So the sensor on here is a 30.3 megapixel sensor. It's an amazing sensor. It's blazing sharp. I don't know how much of that is going to be the sensor or the lens that comes with it, and I'll talk about the lens in the next video. I'm sure it's a combination of the two of them, but your images are unbelievably sharp and unbelievably clear. Um, you take a picture, of, I took a picture of my cat, and you can see all the hair really clear. You can see each grain perfectly. Um, you take a picture of a face, you can see all the detail, all the pores, the skin, the hair, eyes, all the, the grain around the pupil, everything really, really accurately. You zoom in on a photo and you're not going to lose a lot of the detail or anything. It's just great, great sensor. Um, I love it. So one of, one of the best things about this camera that I think most people that have ever shot with a Canon in general, not just this one would agree, is the color science. It's amazing, especially on skin tones. Um, I love my Sony, don't get me wrong, but one issue I have with my Sony, on skin tones specifically, is they come out kind of green and kind of yellowish almost. Um, you can edit that in post, but it's really nice that on the Canon, I don't need to at all. The, the skin tones on this thing are amazing. Um, the lighting is amazing. You get It doesn't have necessarily as great of a dynamic range as the Sony does, but you still get really good details in the colors as far as the difference between dark colors and bright colors. You don't have to go in and create a custom picture profile to get everything set how you want. It's really, really good right out of the box. It's nice to have a camera that doesn't just give you the options. It's already set up that way. Great colors out of the box. Amazing color science on this one. One issue I have with this camera that's kind of this camera, it's kind of the lenses, is the lenses. They're amazing lenses but they're really, really expensive and you don't have a lot of them to pick from right now. I know it's a new format for Canon, the, the RF lens, so you gotta give it time to let them build up the, the line to pick from, but there's not that many to pick from and all the ones that you can get right now are pretty expensive. The, the kit lens that comes with it, if you wanna buy this one by itself, I think it's about 1100 bucks. I found them on most websites actually, pretty consistently on sale for $899. But this is the cheapest lens that you can get for this camera right now, outside of buying an adapter and using an older Canon lens. But if you don't have Canon already, or you don't have that adapter, you're still spending more money, so on and so on, it's expensive to get a lens for this camera. With that being said, the lenses are really, really good. Um, in the next video I do, that I'm gonna do a review about the kit lens. I'll talk more about that then. But I just wish that you had more variety to pick from and that they weren't all so expensive. It's great to have a $2,000 amazing 50 millimeter lens, but it'd be nice to also have the option of having, you know, like a $400 or $500 50 millimeter lens. Obviously the quality wouldn't be as good, but it's nice to give that option to somebody that wants to get a great body to start with and then slowly build up the lens lineup. So maybe down the road they'll have more variety, but right now, not a lot of lenses and they're pretty expensive. So one thing that's kind of strange about this camera that 
I've tried searching online and I haven't been able to find any answers to. I don't know if it's this one that I have, if it's all of these and nobody knows the answer to it, if it's canon or if it's a very easy answer and I just can't find it, I don't know. But a little screen right here shows, you can set it differently, it shows your ISO, your frame rate, shutter speed, so on and so on, it shows all that stuff. My camera's off right now and it's still showing it was last in manual movie mode and Wi-Fi was connected. I don't know why, but that is still on. I open the battery cover, take the battery out. It's gone, it's quiet, it's empty. It's actually turned off now. I put the battery back in. I don't turn on the camera. I just put the battery back in and it pops back up again. Um, I can't imagine that's drawing a lot of power, but it is still drawing power and just kind of strange that for some reason it's not turning off all the way. So I don't know if that's a big issue, but it's just kind of a strange thing, feature, I don't know what you want to call it, something strange I've noticed about this camera. This LCD screen doesn't turn off 100%. Interesting. So lastly, let's talk about price on this camera. Um, the body itself is actually pretty comparable with an a7 III. It's a little bit more expensive. So in that sense, it's not that bad, but let's look at the body, the price, and then the Sony a7 III body and price. So you get more megapixels on this one than the a7 III. But that's about it. You also get a little bit better color science, which you can adjust on your a7 III, but it's annoying, whatever, you can do it. Other than that, the a7 III, for lack of a better term, is a better camera in every possible spec. You have 120 and 1080. You don't have to crop everything other than 1080. Um, it's a better camera. But for some reason, even though this one is more expensive and technically not as good, I find myself enjoying shooting with this actually more than I do Sony. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to explain, but it has a soul to it, which is really hard to explain why my Sony doesn't. I think of it more as like, the Sony's a really good tool. It does its job amazingly, but it doesn't have that same soul. This one, just the way it sits in your hands, the way it feels, the way everything comes right out of the box, it's just really, really fun to shoot with. I find myself wanting to go out randomly out of nowhere and go take pictures more often with this one than I do with my Sony. So spec wise, yes, it's not as good as a Sony that's cheaper. But there's something about it that you can't explain that I really, really like this camera. And I kind of want to get one of these myself now. So we'll see about that. But it's a great camera. Who is this camera for though? Honestly, I don't think this is the kind of camera that you would be doing music videos for, documentaries for, or definitely not weddings considering you only have one card slot. Which again, the Sony, cheaper, has two card slots. But whatever. This camera I think is for a photographer, it's an amazing camera, or somebody that wants to do specifically YouTube videos, vlogging, tutorials, travel videos. It's not going to be as big as the 1DX Mark II, so it's a lot more friendly for that. And you have a lot of really, really good features. So the video is a little limited, but overall I think it's a great camera for doing YouTube videos. I wouldn't recommend it for doing music videos, documentaries, or other things, but YouTube great camera. Photographers, great camera. I think it's actually a better camera for photographers than a Sony, but it's an overall really good camera. It's just kind of expensive and maybe in the next iteration they're going to change some things, get rid of the touch bar, add another wheel, but time will tell. We'll see. Overall, great camera and if you're thinking about picking one up, do what I did. Rent one for the weekend, see what you think, but probably going to like it. I think it's a great camera, probably going to get one. So. Uh, if you like this video, hit like, hit subscribe. I'm trying to hit 500 subscribers right now. You can help me get there. And uh, let me know what you want to see in some future videos. I'm going to be doing some reviews about other things, more tutorials, and doing a little bit more traveling kind of stuff as well. So uh, have a good one.